Hey, Joe, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. I wanted to ask you that you're about to play your 19th game of the season, 18, 16 regular season games, two playoff games. How are you keeping yourself fresh? And um, is there anything different at this point of the year you're doing in terms of training to make sure you're ready for Sunday? Yeah, it's a long season. Um, but I think our coaching staff has done a great job of making sure that we stay fresh throughout practice. You know, they're not running guys into the ground every single week in practice. Some, some weeks we're having some, a lot of walkthrough practices, um, a lot of mental reps. Uh, and then I think guys have done a great job of coming in on the off days, making sure their bodies are right, getting their lifts in. And that's really important in these long seasons in order to, to play well on Sundays. Okay, next is Charlie Goldsmith. Charlie? Joe, we've talked a lot about your connection with Jamar. Uh, every quarterback receiver connection is different. Is there something that's maybe unique about your connection with Jamar that's maybe different from other quarterback receiver combinations in the league? I don't, I don't think so. I think we just have a lot of reps accumulated together. You know, it's all about how, how many times you throw a certain route with a guy and however many times you can talk through certain looks that you might see on that route from the defender, whether he's high hip or low hip or inside leverage or outside leverage. We just have probably more reps accumulated than a lot of people do. Okay, next is Tom Archdeacon. Tom? I, yeah, Joe, I was wondering, uh, with all the stops and successes you've had, uh, Athens High and LSU, and now year one to two with the Bengals. What, what's the part that Ohio State, your time at Ohio State played in this, and what lessons, I don't know, serve you now from there? Yeah, I, had, I wouldn't be the same player that I am today without, you know, those, those trials and, and tribulations that I went through there. You know, I, I loved my time there. I stay, stay in contact with a lot of people from Ohio State. Um, and like I said, I wouldn't be the same player. I, you know, I think I am who I am because of, you know, the difficult times that I went through in my career. And if you look at, you know, all the quarterbacks that were in the playoffs, a lot of them have gone through, you know, a lot of adversity throughout their careers, whether it was early on in high school without offers or after college, not getting drafted high or, you know, having to go to a junior college or anything like that. I think, you know, part of what makes certain people great is the adversity that they've had to go through. Thank you. Next is Wayne Box Miller. Wayne. Hey, thank you. Joe, uh, you're going into a stadium that is reputable for the noise and things of that nature. I wanted to know uh, what college stadium gave you that same kind of experience and how that will help you going into this game. And I'll say thank you in front. You know, in the SEC every single week, it seems like that, you know, every stadium is really loud. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of people. Um, you know, this one is going to be similar. You know, we, we expect it to be really loud. We're talking about it throughout the week. You know, we're going to have to be great with our communication, our nonverbal communication, just like every week on the road. Michelle Steele at ESPN. Michelle? Hey, Joe. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, you know, I think we all know at this point, this is a Chiefs team that can be just really explosive. How important is it for you guys to come out fast on Sunday? And is that something that's um, been a little bit more extra emphasized, uh, especially in the postseason? Yeah, you always want to get out to a strong start, put some points on the board early and kind of control the game like we have the last two weeks. Um, you know, you can't, can't let a team like this get out in front of you because then – you know, they put a lot of pressure on you on defense. You know, they're going to blitz you and, and make you, you know, uncomfortable back there if you get down. You know, we got down 14 nothing in the last game, and it's not exactly where we wanted to be at that point in the game. We were able to, to fight out of it and ended up winning the game, but, you know, we'd like to have a stronger start. Next up is James Rappian. James? Hey, Joe, a quick two-parter for you. Uh, the first part, uh, C.J. Uzama mentioned – that uh, the headset went out, which we, we noticed, but you had to call some of your own plays last week. Have you ever been in that position on the road where you kind of had to ad lib it? And how long did you have to do that? No, I've never been in that position before. That was kind of exciting for me. Um, you know, Zach always kind of jokes that, hey, you know, don't, don't pretend like the headset goes out so you can call your own plays. But, you know, on Sunday or Saturday, you know, the headset did go out. And so I had to call three or four plays on my own and, 
you know, all, all of them worked. So that was, that was fun. Given that uh, you had to go on the road, Nissan stadium, it was really loud. We were there. It was really loud. Is that beneficial going into this week? It might not have been as loud as Arrowhead's going to be, but is that beneficial for the offense as a whole? Yeah, I think every week when you're on the road, you, know, you have to be ready to be great in your nonverbal communication. And, you know, we, we went through it last week. We've gone through it, you know, certain points of the season. Um, so we're, you know, we've played, we've been really, really good on the road. Um, we're going to have to be good again this week. Okay, next up is Aditi Kinkabwala. Aditi? Hey, Joe. Um, I was talking to T. Higgins about how you are always so level. And he said that only Jamar Chase can get you angry or riled up. Is that indeed true? How does he do it? And are you always like this? Like, are you always that calm? Are you always that cool? Yeah, I try to be. I think you know, as a quarterback in this league, you have to, you can't have these highs and lows. You're not going to be able to be successful. The season is too long. You're going to have losses. And if you get down on yourself, you know, you're not going to be able to perform the next week and you're going to have, you know, really big highs. And if you ride those highs, you're going to eventually come crashing down. So you really have to stay level headed throughout the entire season. And, you know, games are just a microcosm of, of the entire year. And so uh, as far as Jamar goes, you know, Jamar, you know, we've been, we've been together for a long time. So he kind of knows how to get under my skin every now and then. <laughs> okay. Next up is Jeff Hobson, Jeff. Joe, how you doing? Good. How are you, Hobbs? Good. Hey, I wonder if you could talk about the balance between holding on to the ball and trying to make a play. And, uh, you know, uh, you've made so many plays, you know, on instincts, and you've had to hold the ball. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Have you, is that something that you keep learning about? Uh, did you learn something sun, uh, on Saturday? Or can you talk about walking that line between holding it and making a play? Yeah, that's always something that, you know, you have to take into account. You can't, you know, Saturday was disappointing on two plays, two of the sacks I took when we were in field goal range and one of them got us out of field goal range and Evan, you know, kicked a longer one than he should have needed to. So those two plays were disappointing to me. Um, I think I've been pretty good all year about, you know, understanding when I can extend a play and when I just need to throw the ball away. Um, sometimes you're going to have to hang in there and, and try to make a big play in certain parts of the game. Um, and I think I've been good at that all year. You know, like I said, those, those, those two plays last game were disappointing. Next up is Ben Volin. Ben. <clears throat> hey, Joe, uh, congrats on uh, the playoff run and getting this far. Um, you. You're coming back from uh, a pretty significant knee injury this year. And, you know, a lot of guys in the past, they say that it can take them up to a full year to really kind of gain that confidence back in their knee again. Where are you in that? And just kind of how do you feel overall with uh, the knee injury this year? Yeah, I wouldn't say that I had less confidence on it earlier, but I would say that I wasn't able to do certain things that I had been able to do in the past, like make people miss in the pocket and extend plays. You know, I really couldn't do that until, you know, after the bye week is when I started to finally feel like myself. And I think that's when I started to play my best football. Next up is Charles Walford. Charles. Thank you. Uh, hi, Joe. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Charles? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks. Um, just one. Obviously, three and a half weeks ago, you played the Chiefs and uh, Jamar Chase had had a, well, one of those days. And then on, on Sunday, they um, the Chiefs managed to shut down Stefan Diggs quite well. How important is it that sort of T and Tyler are prepared and ready to be the main man this week in the way that um, Gabe Davis stepped up for the for the Bills? Yeah, that's you know I think that's what makes our receiving room great. Is not only is every single person in that room able to have a game like that, they don't get upset if they're not the guy that has that kind of game. So Jamar could go for zero yards and and T and TB combined for three hundred, and Jamar would be just as happy as if he had a 250 yard game. Uh, I think that's very unique to us. I don't know if there a lot of, you know, receiving rooms in the league have that. And I think that's what makes, that's what makes those guys great. Hey Zach, seeing the way the defense has uh, 
played all season long and seeing what they were last year, how much do you think that individual players only meeting that the defensive back started this season on Tuesdays has helped? And can you give us a specific example of where you think maybe a meeting like that can help on the field? Well, I think it allows them to, to communicate in their own way. It, it's They have a clear understanding of the scheme, you know, that we've employed and, um, you know, especially with Vaughn and Jesse being here, you know, especially the last two or three years, the linebackers. Um, so then when you add Cheeto and Eli and Mike, they can have that meeting. And when we added veteran players, so, this, so that, you know, the, the scheme's not that much different um, from other places they've been. So I, I think it's good to make sure that the players are always on the same page. That's what we always say, you know, as long as 11 guys are playing the same call, um, you got a chance to do something well, even if, even if something's a little bit off or the communication's a little off, as long as 11 guys get the same call. Um, and so I, I like that they've created that chemistry together where they meet on their own. Um, I know the whole defense does that on Friday as well. And, and that's, that's good to see from the players. You want them to have that ownership. Next up is Marisa Contepelli. Marisa. Hey, Zach. Um, over the last two weeks, you know, it really seems like Jesse Bates has kind of played his two best games of the season. Just how much better is this defense when Jesse is playing at such a high level? And, you know, what has it been, um, you know, now that the postseason has started that Jesse's kind of like elevated his game a little bit? I, I think Jesse's played good ball from us, you know, for a while now. And and sometimes the, the turnovers bring more attention to a player. But um, Jesse's Jesse's obviously been invaluable for us. Um, he's a big part of what we do, and and you always rest a little bit easier knowing that Jesse and Bonner are there on the back end to help you. Next up is Ben Baby. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, Zach. Hey, uh, real quick, what, what's probably the, the toughest lesson that you learned in 2019 that, that has helped you maybe grow the most as a coach uh, this year? Um, just, just how important uh, the relationships are. You know, because you're going to face adversity like we did in 2019. There, there's plenty of adversity we faced this year. Um, and again, if there's no if there's no communication, if there's no relationship amongst the coaches, coaches, players to coaches, um, then then there's no real trust there, and and there's um, it becomes much more difficult to get on the same page and and overcome that adversity. And so I, I think that that was obviously our hardest year. Um, we were all getting to know each other. But I, but I think that we did a good job getting to know each other as best we could in that short amount of time. And, and that helped serve us well, and it's helped serve us well over the last three years. Is there a specific example this season where, where that maybe came to fruition, where you were, where all of those things that you learned that year, you know, really played a part in something that, that kind of helped you out? I, I can't necessarily give you a, a great example of that right now. Maybe, maybe if I have more time to reflect on it, I could. Okay, next up is Charlie Goldsmith. Go ahead, Charlie. Obviously, in the first Chiefs game, Joe and Jamar had a lot of success. What did you learn uh, about what they can do in that game, and what was the biggest reason they were successful? Well, they, they took advantage of some one-on-one -on -one opportunities, and it was accurate throws, good good coverage awareness, and Jamar made some great plays. Um, they were on the same page, you know, against some of the zone coverages. Chiefs do a great job of, of employing a variety of schemes and, um, you know, trying to keep you off balance. And, and I thought that, that Joe and Jamar did a good job being on the same page and making the most of their opportunities. Okay, hey, Charles Walford. Go ahead, Charles. Hi, Coach. Thanks for, thanks for talking to us. Um, just along that theme, obviously last week, uh, Gabriel Davis had a, had a great game for the Bills. Have you got um, T and Tyler sort of knocking on your door saying, you know, why don't you scheme us in? It's our, it's our turn to, uh, to get a bit of the glory and, and obviously after Chase's uh, performance last time. Well, I think that's really the beauty of, of Joe Burrow. And... And really just how we organize the offense is we don't feel like we have to force the ball to anybody. Um, the ball goes to where, where the coverage dictates with the concept. And um, obviously, you know, over the course of the year, each of those guys have had their big games and their big moments. And there's been games, maybe they've had two or three catches, but they're, they were critical for us. And so that's, that's why it's key to have such an unselfish group of receivers where they all know they're going to have their moments. Um, there's going to be days where one guy maybe gets 15 targets and the other guys don't, but um, when the balls do come their way, they got to make the most of it. And, and I think that's, that's just kind of a great um, uh, picture of our entire locker room. It's just that receiver room and how unselfish those guys are and how much they pull for each other. Next question is Dave Lapham. Dave. Coach, when you were rebuilding this football team from a personnel standpoint to so the draft and free agency, um, what were the non-negotiables? from a character standpoint, when you were evaluating these guys and thinking about adding them to the organization? Yeah, got to love ball. 
you know, that's that's the most important thing. You want guys who, because it's a grind. You know, we're here at the end of January. We've been at this since since the end of July. Um, it, it's a long six or seven months, whatever it is. And and if you got guys who um, don't love the game and don't love the process, then it, it's hard to get to where you want to go. You might have some great moments, some great games, but ultimately it's going to fizzle out. And so when you're you're adding, you know, we had a, we had a draft class where almost every guy was a captain on their college team. So I think those are just indicators of of the process that we go through and it didn't find the guys that we want in the locker room. Um, guys that love ball and, and coincidentally, they happen to be great people as well and, and have been great teammates. Mike Petraglia. Mike? Hey, Zach. I'm curious, during the week when you, Joe Burrow, and Brian Callahan go over the game plan, how much of that actually gets applied during the game? And how much do you see Joe going off script because the situation or the defense dictates that? Um, you know, I, I think shoot, just looking at the call sheet we had against the Chiefs last time, you know, we probably got uh, 40, 50 percent of the normal down calls called, you know, and so if you just look at it that way, it's it's obviously um, you're going to adjust as the game goes to how the, how the other team's playing you. Um, um, so that's just kind of an indicator of, of how much you carry into a game and how much you actually get run. Um, you know, certainly Joe's, Joe's got the freedom to, to check whenever he wants to. You know, we, we have built in checks oftentimes where he's got two or three plays that are packaged together and he knows the looks he's supposed to get to each one. Uh, but, but the thing with Joe is you trust the prep work that he's put into the week and you trust that if he ever sees something that, that he wants to get to, as long as he can get 11 guys all on the same page very quickly. Um, I love to see that because that means he's got confidence in something. He's going to make it work. If, if he knows the responsibility that comes with, with going outside the box and, and he's earned that. And, and I like to see it. Wayne box Miller. Go ahead, Wayne. Thank you. Coach, um, as this team has gone into the playoffs, uh, you've continued to play well week over week over week. What do you look at and point to as something that has really been significant in that success? Winning the turnover battle, you know, really, the last six weeks. Um, we've been best in the league <clears throat> recently at that, and, and that's something we've hammered all season, obviously. But I think it's no secret when you got more possessions than the other team, um, you're taking away red zone opportunities like we did last week from Tennessee then, uh, you know, we're giving ourselves a better opportunity to win the game. And, and we feel like we've got a good enough team that if we're going to steal possessions, um, you know, we can take control of the game. And I think our guys have just done an outstanding job of that on, uh, in all three phases. Thank you. Next up is Michelle Steele. Hey, Coach. Um, it's been a big theme this week. I know that you've addressed it somewhat already, but ultimately, is there one key? Is there, are there several keys to keeping Joe clean against the pass rush on Sunday? Yeah, it's it, there's a lot of things that play into it. Um, starting with with me putting him in the best position, putting our guys in the best position to block the other team, and be prepared for pressures and and all that kind of stuff. So we, we spent a lot of time and effort um, talking through that. Some games it's great, some games we're going to need to improve. And um, you know, certainly we we put a lot of time and effort into making sure that we can have the cleanest pocket possible for Joe on Sunday. Okay, next up is Laurel Failer. Go ahead, Laurel. Thank you. Um, you've said nothing surprises you about Joe, but taking away maybe what you know about him as a person, how remarkable is it for you or for your quarterback to come back from a major knee injury like this and just overcome what he has this season and get you guys to this point of playing in an AFC championship? Yeah, you know, he, he really has um, overcome that. That's been significant. I'm sure there was a lot of uncertainty on his end as well on how he was going to respond. You, you know, he wanted to respond the right way, but but he'd never been through something like that before. Um, so I think it has been impressive, you know, the, the way he's played this last stretch of the season, particularly now that he's felt fully healthy. And again, he doesn't, um, you know, we never take him for granted, but, but there's a lot of really impressive things he does um, that maybe aren't as impressive to us anymore because we're just used to it. And that's kind of his standard, his greatness. And, and uh, but, but again, we, we do step back and always take a moment to appreciate what we've got there at that quarterback position. Next up is Jeremy Roush. Jeremy. Hey, Zach, I wanted to ask you about Joe Mixon. Uh, we know that his personality is very infectious around the team. He spends around what feels like 20 to 30 minutes throwing the ball with fans pregame a lot of the times. Um, do you notice that about Joe? And what does that say about his character that he does take that time to do that with a lot of young fans? 
Yeah, I think Joe's always been tremendous uh, with the interactions he's had with the community. And, it, I, you know, I don't really pay much attention to that in pregame. I, I know what happens, but it's not something I pay a lot of attention to. But, my, you know, my kids go to his summer camp in the summer. Uh, there's pro camps they put on, and, and he always does such a tremendous job with those kids. And so that's kind of my window into him interacting with the community and a bunch of younger kids that really look up to him. And um, he, he's any interaction he's ever had with my two boys has been awesome. You know, they've got Joe Mixon fat heads and posters all over the room. And, and so I think that's, that's as good of an indicator as anything uh, of, of how the Taylor household views him, you know, and, and that's usually a pretty good window into how the rest of the community looks at him as well. Next up is James Rappian. James? Coach, I have a two-part question for you. Um, first part, have you ever had uh, a quarterback have to call his own plays? And what's that like on the road as a play caller? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, uh, the, the headset, when we were in Miami, it felt like the headset went out all the time, you know, and, and so Tannehill would have to have to do that. And you always have to be prepared for that. Uh, Joe did a really good job. You know, there was a, probably a three or four play sequence there where um, he had to call his own plays because it went out and did a great job managing that and finding completions for us. And um, you really like that because you, you get a window into his brain on what he really likes in that go-to moment. And it, it, there was no surprises there, I would say, but um, he found his completions. He helped us move the ball down the field. It, it's something we'll always be open to. You know, I think as, as further seasons go <clears throat> and he gets more, even more experience in the league, that's something you, you want the quarterback to be able to go out there and call four or five play sequence, you know, and, and keep the defense on their hills and let Joe assess what's going on defensively and, and uh, get us into the right looks. And, um, you know, you don't always want to do that because th th he's got to go through a physical play and, and you got to be thinking, then you got to process, okay, what's the down of distance and do we run or pass here? And so um, I think it was good in the dose that he did it, uh, but it's some, certainly something in the future that, that he'll have the freedom to do and, and do for longer stretches than he's done at points this year. And speaking of the defense, how different on film is this Chiefs defense from when you played them on January 2nd? Same month, you know, so again, yeah. their identity is their identity. It's got them this far. It's, it's got them to multiple Super Bowls, um, you know, so I, I don't think there's any shock there. Everyone's going to have adjustments. You know, there's oftentimes you play divisional games and, and there's some tweaks and modifications there as, as they play you a second time. Um, same on our end. But uh, again, they've got tremendous players. They've got a great coaching staff. They do a really good job putting them in position, putting pressure on the offense. Um, so again, we'll, we'll have to have our plan in place and then be ready to adjust as the game goes. Next up is Aditi Kinkabwala. Go ahead, Aditi. Zach, we talk so much about when a team has playoff experience versus players that don't. When you're facing a coach who has coached longer than you've been alive, how do you mitigate that? And do you get any anxiety about that? That, you know, he's seen every play that could possibly ever have been played. What do I do? I, I've got so much respect for him. Uh, you're right. The experience does factor in. You know, he, he's experienced a lot of situations and he's probably learned from every single one of them. And then there's, there's certainly a calmness on his end, I would imagine, um, because he's been there, done that. He's been there, done that with his group of guys at the same time. Um, but on the flip side of it, we spent a lot of time and effort talking through situations um, with our coaching staff and then, and then figuring out which ones we want to incorporate with our team as well that we present to them. Um, and so again, I've got a lot of faith in, in our communication process and our players being able to handle uh, difficult situations that come up on a, on a moment's notice at the end of a game or end of a half or critical moment. I think we've been a really good situational team this year. Our players have handled that. And so I've got the confidence that we'll be able to handle those, those moments in big games like this. Okay, time for just a couple more questions. Next is Dan Horde. Go ahead, Dan. Zach, the Chiefs have scored 42 in each playoff game. It's obviously one of the best offenses in the NFL. Does that force you to change your approach at all in terms of play calling, going for it on fourth down, et cetera? You know, we, we will have those conversations. We've already had some. We'll have them as the week continues. Um, you know, that those are things we'll, we'll keep a little closer to the vest. But um, it, it does it does change on the, on the opponent, on the quarterback, on the defense, on the off. There's a lot of things that factor in, the punt returner, the kick returner. Um, so we'll take all those in and, and we'll make the best decisions for us as we get to get to Sunday. But um, we all know they're an explosive team. They can score in a moment's notice. Um, we, we feel like, you know, we can put pressure on teams as well. Okay. And our last question today goes to Kelsey Conway. Go ahead, Kelsey. Hey, Zach, could you give us an injury update for the group and just the state of the team heading into practice today? Yeah, I think uh, Josh Tupo, Stanley Morgan, um, Cam Sample, those are the guys that are, are limited or, or will, will 
regularly practice this week. Um, I wouldn't rule any of them out this at this point in the week, but um, those are the three really that are worth conversation.